Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. I have found a fantastic Neville Goddard lecture today. This one was delivered on April 5th, 1971, called Proof the Law Works. It is very rare to find one of the later lectures in the 70s by Neville Goddard that really wasn't about the promise. When he's speaking about the law, it's fantastic. And this is particularly good because Neville would always ask for proof that the law works by getting letters from the people that watched his lectures. So we have decades of different letters and stories that he's gathered up to this point. And in April 5th, 1971, he delivered a lecture on proof that the law works. This is delivered approximately one year and six months prior to his death. And each of the decades that Neville Goddard gives his lectures, you can tell there's a little bit of a difference. And this one I thought was very powerful proof that the law works by Neville Goddard. Paul in his letter to the Galatians says, I see that you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I've labored over you in vain. Now here we are, this crowded week of observing these different days, and this is the season, and naturally it is the year. What did Paul give to the world? What he gave to the world is this, that the Spirit of God and the human imagination are one. He said, We did not receive the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we may understand the gifts bestowed upon us by God. Here is the one that became many, that the many may become one, for one must be all, and comprehend within himself all things, both small and great, Blake from the four Zoas. Everything in the world, all that I behold, though it appears without, it is within, within my imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow, Blake from Jerusalem. So we are told that I, if I be lifted up, I will lift up all men and draw all men unto me. Now we are told he is lifted up, therefore all men are already redeemed. But they have to experience it within themselves. They are already redeemed. But in this world of mortality, this must be now, I would say repeated, within the individual, for he must contain and experience all within himself. There is only God in this world. God only acts and is in existing beings or men, Blake from The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Now let me share with you a story that was given to me last Friday night. This lady's husband's name is Ray. When I use the word Ray, I am speaking of her husband. She said last year Ray said to me, it's going to cost a thousand dollars to put on a new roof. We need the roof, but it will cost a thousand dollars. She didn't say they could not afford it. She said, I saw the new roof. Right then and there, I saw the new roof. Then she said, I was working at my sewing machine. It's an old one, but it was adequate. It did the job, but I would like a new one. She said, and so I imagined a new one. Here is the old one, but I imagined a new one. Then I was putting away my tape recorder, and I felt how heavy this thing is. I would like a new lightweight one. I put the old one away, the heavy one, but I thought I would like a new one that is light of weight. So I put away the new one that was light of weight. Then she said, Ray said to me, my new shoes hurt. He had just bought them and they were hurting. Well, I wanted him to have shoes that did not hurt. I did that in my imagination. All of this was last year. Then came the turn of the calendar and we had a robbery. No, they didn't steal the roof, but they took other movable objects. And this past week, I got a settlement from the insurance company for $2,050-odd. I now have nice new sewing machine. I have my nice, lightweight tape recorder. Ray's shoes do not hurt, and there is money for the roof, with much, much left over. Now, who instigated the robbery? Now, on Friday, you will hear, if you go to service, the seven words on the cross. Three taken from Luke, three from John, and one from Matthew and Mark. It's the same one from Matthew and Mark, which is the fourth one. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the one taken... From these two Gospels, but the first one used on the cross is from Luke. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Everything is moving under compulsion. No one sees the invisible causation. 
No one sees the invisible imaginal act that is putting pressure upon everyone who is bent in a certain direction to perform the needed act to produce the imaginal act that is completely unseen by the world. Here, every natural effect has a spiritual cause, and not a natural. A natural cause only seems. It is a delusion of the fading vegetable memory. Blake from Milton Now in her letter to me, she said, These things I remember. They were all last year, but I remember them. In her case, she is blessed that she can remember when Ray said to her, It's going to cost a thousand dollars to put on the new roof. And I saw the new roof even though at the moment he thought he could not now afford a new roof. When I used my sewing machine, it was adequate, it was good, it did the job, but I would like a new one, and I saw a new one. And when I put away my tape recorder, it was all right, it was adequate, but it was heavy when I put it away. I thought I've seen all these nice new lightweight ones, and I would like a nice lightweight one, a good one. Now she said, I have all of them. I have my nice new lightweight recorder, my new machine, raised shoes that do not hurt, and the roof will be a new one. The money is there and much left over. So the first cry on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They are all asleep, moving under compulsion. And men and women unwittingly, most of them, some wittingly, are setting the whole thing in motion, and they simply move. So someone given to the feeling of getting something for nothing, he takes the recorder. If he sells it for anything, that's for profit. It cost him nothing. No matter what it cost her, whatever he could get for it was sheer profit. If he goes out and finds something that he stole and he could move it quickly for $15 and one gets a bargain, he made $15. It cost him nothing. His investment was nothing and there are those in the world who think that way. They are all passing through the furnaces. So the first word on the cross, a word on the cross does not mean a single word, it's a completed thought. So the shortest word is, I thirst. But there are two words, so the next one from John is, it is finished. There are three words, all right, still it is one word when you take the seven words. So the first word is from Luke, Father forgive them, they know not what they do. And then comes Luke's second, then comes John's first, then comes Matthew and Mark, then come two from John, and then Luke completes it. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. This little punctuation mark has been pushed around in the second word on the cross, which is from Luke. And the thief turns to him and asks him to have mercy on him. And he said, Behold, I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, you can alter the punctuation and put the comma after today. But no, leave it just as it is. Behold, I say unto you, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. This is now resurrection. And I, when I am lifted, I will draw all men unto me. For all things are in my own wonderful human imagination, and I am all imagination. So when I am lifted up, I draw all. At the very moment, I draw them all with me. But they individually must have the experience that I have had, but they are already redeemed, because I took them up with me. Because all things exist in the human imagination and anyone who is resurrected, but he can't be resurrected and leave behind him any parts of himself, so the whole world is raised up with him. I am telling you from experience. The heavenly chorus sings when this thing takes place. They sing the fall, the actual fall into division and the resurrection into unity. They sing it out. And then the regeneration through resurrection from the dead, they actually sing it out. And the words, it is finished, I heard it, but I didn't sing it. The heavenly chorus sang it. When I walked by and everyone was made perfect because I was perfect, and then at the very end, the chorus sang out, it is finished. That was the sixth word on the cross. And the last one is when this garment comes off, and that is the 31st Psalm, the 5th verse. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Complete the verse. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. That was the promise in the beginning. I would fall into division and become fragmented, dwelling in all, that not a thing in this world could be apart from me, because how could I be apart from something that I am going to influence? Because all things by a law divine in one another's being mingle. Shelley. If I am not 
penetrating you now. I couldn't see you. You couldn't hear me if I did not penetrate you and you penetrate me, so all things by a law divine in one another's being mingle. So when I am lifted up, I take with me my entire universe, my whole vast world, knowing that every one that is now shattered in that world will have a repetition of the same experience. For one fell into division and then resurrected into unity, bringing all back together into the one. So in her case, I can't tell you how thankful I am that she shared it with me, that she could now actually feel that the robbery which seemed at the moment such a shock. She lost the tape recorder, she lost this, all the movable objects, and then came the settlement from the insurance company for $2,050-odd, which replaced these with the new ones, all the light ones, and enough to put on a new roof. And then some still left over. So, Father, forgive them. Yes, the thieves are thieves. It's yourself pushed out anyway. Here someone tonight is accused for stealing maybe what? A little cup or a saucer, and yet the bank where I bank, the United California Bank, they are still looking for the internal thieves who stole $50 million last year from their subsidiary in Basel, Switzerland. $50 million, and they know it is all on the inside. It can only be on the inside by trusted employees. They think they can bring it down to six, six trusted employees. They can't quite put their fingers on it because in Switzerland they have all these strange hidden accounts. But they are missing $50 million. So when someone goes into the bank and holds it up and gets $1,000 and we balloon the whole thing, the other thing is hush hush. Here is a bank in Illinois a few months ago that lost close to $7 million and they still can't quite put their finger on how it happened on the inside. No one came in and robbed them, and we speak of the little shoplifting on the outside, and the poor little girl goes off to jail, or the little boy goes off to jail. I'm not condoning it. If you could stop the embezzlement from the inside, your dividends would jump from their present little 3% or 4% to 20%. If you could only stop it from the inside, all things happen really, in the true sense of the word, from the inside. So every so-called act in the outer world that seems a cause in itself, may I tell you, every natural effect has a spiritual imaginal cause, and not a natural. A natural cause only seems. It's a delusion of what? The fading memory. Man can't quite remember, luckily. She remembered when Ray said we could use and need a new roof, but it would cost a thousand dollars, and so that is put into the future. She remembered when he complained the new shoes were hurting. In her mind's eye, she revised it instantly. At the moment, the roof and the shoes. When she worked on the machine, she revised it. It was adequate, but she said, I have a new machine, sewing machine, and putting the heavy tape recorder away, she wanted a new one that was light of weight, and she revised it. And she got in her mind's eye a lightweight new tape recorder. Then she goes home one day to find the house has been robbed. She had carried insurance, so she brought in the insurance people and here they paid her the $2,000 which replaced all these things in a new way. So I tell you, the story is the greatest story ever told. There is no story like it, but Christianity needs forever and forever to be saved from secular history. It is not secular history, it's the history of your own wonderful human imagination. God and your imagination are one. They are one. You are an immortal being. You cannot die because you are all imagination. When you actually know it from experience, then you can wipe your tears. Nothing can pass away. You may not see them with the mortal eye, touch them with the mortal hand, but they are in a world just as real as this, just as real continuing the journey until they reach that moment in time when they are resurrected and then scattered body begins to be collected and they are gathered together into one. So. One must be all and comprehend within himself all things, both great and small. Blake from the four Zoas. And you are that one that actually fell. And then, in falling, you became fragmented. You became divided into the unnumbered parts, and each seems to be independent of you as you look out on it. You are only looking out on yourself pushed out. And your whole vast world must make real your unknowing imaginal acts or your knowing imaginal acts. I ask you to trust this teaching. Believe in your imaginal acts. You may not see it tonight or tomorrow, but believe in it. Actually assume 
the most glorious thing in the world for yourself or any aspect of yourself. Trust it. And that imaginal act, if it takes a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand of your projected selves, will use them to make that thing become real in your world. As she said in her letter to me, you may call it imagination or some may call it thought, but this I do know. Having remembered what I did last year, I can say it does produce reality. I've told you time and time again that imagining creates reality. That all the objective facts in the world are produced through imagination. There isn't a thing that you can name in this world that wasn't first imagined. But you can veto it the minute you imagine it. You can say as she could have said, we can't afford it and stop it. She didn't say, we can't afford the thousand dollars for the roof. She saw the roof and it was new, but she didn't see the robbery. That's the means. Let us turn you now to the 55th chapter of Isaiah. My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than yours. This is the chapter where you are told, my word shall not return unto me void, but it must accomplish that which I propose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So my ways are higher than your ways. Don't concern yourself with how it's going to be done. For the same voice who spoke these words said this in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, the 39th verse. I, even I, am he. I kill and I make alive. I wound, I heal. I do all these things and none can deliver out of my hands. He is playing all the parts. And if one is basically inclined to steal, he will use him to produce the necessary means to get the money to put on the roof. So she comes home and there was a robbery. All the things have been replaced with new ones and better ones as she desired them. At the moment, it seemed to be a shock, but she set the whole thing up in motion for she's the one who spoke those words. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal and none can deliver out of my hands. For the spirit of God and the human imagination are one and there is nothing but God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And so if all things are made by him, is there a thief in the world? He's playing that part. Is there a so-called hero in the world? He's playing that part. A coward? He's playing that part. He is playing every part in the world and it all adds up to produce the unseen, imaginal acts of men. So you are alone and you think, no one sees me and this means nothing. It's only my imagination and you carry on your lovely imaginal act. And so that's it, not knowing that you're actually producing tomorrow's effects in this world. And when it comes into the world, that natural effect has an unseen, invisible, imaginal act as cause and not a natural cause. A natural cause only seems. It is a delusion. A delusion of what? Of your fading memory. You don't remember when you did it. So when confronted with your own harvest, you can't quite believe it. You can't remember when you did anything that would actually be like this. I didn't rob myself. I never thought for one moment of robbery to get the money. No, but I did see the whole thing done. And there are thieves in the world, all over the world, and they're all played by God. There is nothing but God. God only acts and is in existing beings or men. Blake from the marriage of heaven and hell. Now let me find that actor because God only acts and he is in all existing beings or men. Well, I'm a man. I've got to find that actor for the thing that I see reflected in the mirror when I shave in the morning is a mask. That's a persona. Now who is wearing that mask? I am. You simply say Neville and I turn around and say, yes, here I am. But who is the being that is there? I am. That's my real name, but the mask is called Neville. But I will say, I am Neville. So the wearer of the mask called Neville responds, that being in that mask, behind that mask, that no one sees is God. And now the whole vast Christendom will celebrate this victory of God, that he actually died, literally died. But God's first attribute is mercy. And God turned death into sleep and then rose the sexes to work and to weep. Blake paraphrased from to Terza. And so all the sexes rose en masse when God died. He buried himself in humanity and died. And then his first attribute, mercy, turned it into sleep. That is what Blake meant when he said eternity exists and all things in eternity 
independent of creation which was an act of mercy, from a vision of the Last Judgment. That was the merciful act, to turn death into sleep, and God is dreaming this dream. One day he will awake, and when he awakes he resurrects, and then he gathers into his own being all his scattered beings, so all are gathered. When I depart this time, may I tell you, I am taking everything in the universe with me, and I, when I am lifted up, I will raise all unto me. Read it in the twelfth chapter of John. Not one can be left because all things exist in the human imagination, but it's not raised up until he who is scattered is awakened to unity, and then he draws into his own being all that was scattered. So they sing his fall into division, and his resurrection into unity, his fall into the generation of decay and death, and his regeneration into the resurrection from the dead. So, when he actually is raised from the dead, he gathers all into his being, and they are all with him. No matter where he goes, he has the whole vast world raised up. He hasn't left one behind him, but everyone shattered in the world will have a reproduction of that drama in themselves. So what is now being dramatized as a memorial this week, for this is really a memorial, this is simply a great memory, a remembrance of what God has already accomplished, and so they are perpetuating it through Good Friday, and then comes the burials on Saturday, then comes the resurrection on Sunday. But the whole thing is done. It's all done, only to be repeated in the individual, and then the individual who is seemingly scattered becomes the unit, and he draws his vast world unto himself, and he is resurrected. So the one becomes the many, and then the many become the one. So whenever one is raised, he takes the whole vast world with him, even though it seems to be left behind, and every aspect that seemingly is behind becomes the unit, and then it raises up. So one must be all. That is the story of the Christian mystery. One must be all. So the first cry on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And they do not know what they do. They go blindly on under compulsion, executing the unseen imaginal acts of humanity, and they move under compulsion. I told the story, and I was severely criticized for it by a lady at a dinner party one night when Fred Bales, who is now gone from this world, gave a party at the Ambassador Hotel and I had told this story about two weeks before to one of his great, I would say, contributors who would come and always write a huge big check at the end of a year or the end of a month to keep that going. And she was most critical that night. I didn't feel well that night at all. And she said, you know, I can't quite understand how you could take the platform before an audience of 2,600, a thousand who could not get in. They were all overflowing at the Fox Wilshire and tell what you told about your wife. This was my first wife. I told a simple story to explain that everything in this world must be forgiven, no matter what it is. When I met the girl who now bears my name and who is the mother of my daughter, the very first time I met her, I knew she was going to be my wife. She didn't know it, but I knew it. I said to myself, she doesn't know it, she is going to be my wife. We sailed for Barbados six months later and she met my mother and met my family, met them all. They all loved her. That was back in 1936. In New York City, because of the archaic law that is now passed, you couldn't get a divorce unless she was insane for seven years or for adultery, and that's all. The Orthodox Christian churches had sewed the whole thing up so that it made life miserable and made everything simply a burden to all. When I met her, I had just such an entangled background, and here it's New York City, the most archaic city in the world concerning such laws. I went to bed and slept as though I was happily married to the girl who now bears my name. I did not have any physical emotion with her, just that she was sleeping there and I am here and it's blissful. I did that for one solid week. Then comes a telephone call from the court one morning telling me that I must come down to this federal court on Tuesday morning. Well, I was groggy. It was early in the morning and in those days I didn't rise as early as I do now. So I just said, all right, and I hung up. Well, on Tuesday morning that I am supposed to be there, I made no effort to go there and about 9.30 the phone rang, it's the court. And they said to me, you're supposed to be here in the court this morning. We meet at 10. And I said, what on earth am I supposed to be in court for? They said, well, it happens that your wife is arrested. And we thought maybe you could throw some light on the reason for her arrest. That's why we are asking for you to come down. Well, I wasn't shaved. I simply threw myself into some clothes and off I went in a taxi down to the court. I got there just as they were bringing her in. 
a man whispered into there were three judges into one judge's ear and i was in the audience the judge asked me to take the stand you don't have to swear but will you please take the stand and throw some light on the behavior of your wife she tells me you have been separated now for almost 14 years i said yes is it a religious reason why you've been separated i said no none whatsoever we knew we were wrong the very first day we got married we knew it was a complete failure right away then he read the case she was picked up for shoplifting they went to her home and found other things in her home he said what can you say for this i said as far as i'm concerned i don't think that really she is a shoplifter as far as i'm concerned she just moved under compulsion take into consideration her age she is eight years my senior and she is passing through a certain emotional state and due by lenient we have a son who lives with me and i don't want anything to happen to his mother that would cast any shadow on his life he is a wonderful boy he is in my charge by law he is in my home lives with me and i don't want anything to happen to her that in any way would reflect upon my son the judge said you know in all my years on the bench i have heard no plea by one for another who has every reason in this world to get her committed because that in any other state would be enough for a divorce and yet he pleads for her he sentenced her to six months and then on my plea he suspended it he met on the outside and said neville that was a very decent thing to do give me the, my papers she knew to what i was looking for my dancing partner had told her i was looking for her to serve the papers and therefore to be scarce and move out of new york city so she did but she had to commit the act and they had to call me and ask me to throw light upon that how could i condemn her who was the actual cause of her shoplifting i slept as though i were blissfully married to the girl who now bears my name and i had to get the evidence i had to get some reason to bring the action and here my wife actually gave me the papers i said i don't have the papers with me she said i'm driving home to your place right now and you can give me the papers that is illegal to serve your own papers but she drove up to my hotel where i was living i went to my room and came down to the lobby and gave her the papers did my own serving now that is an illegal thing in this world then i got my divorce in the city of new york then i could marry the girl who now bears my name when i told that i told it only to tell people of that one word the first word on the cross father forgive them for they know not what they do they are all moving under compulsion and the unseen causation is hidden from the world they do not know who is treading in the wine press and i was treading in the wine press to be happily married to a girl who was not then engaged to me i couldn't be engaged to her under the circumstances and then my wife behaved in such a manner that it made it real and natural for me to do what i did how could i blame her so the first word on the cross father forgive them they know not what they do they have to do what they do i had to fall into division and fragment my being into the unnumbered parts called humanity and then rise into unity and gather all my scattered members together and rise as god myself that's the story it is god who fell and god who rises so i know from my own experience that nothing dies those who have not had the experience here all right they are restored in a world that is terrestrial just like this and they continue their journey until that moment in time when they are resurrected and resurrection is resurrection into unity and the outpictured world the whole vast universe it's himself pushed out is gathered together then and they move up and i when i am lifted up from the earth i will draw all men unto me see it this is the mystery of which we speak here night after night you are not some tiny little thing just pushed out you are the whole one must be all and the day will come you will find that you really are all so not one person in the universe could be outside of you when you are resurrected because as you are raised up you raise all with you and each will have the experience of being raised up and all eventually will be the one and in the day they shall be one his name one and we are told in zachariah but blake tells it so beautifully in his dream of nine nights called vala or the four zoas and then he tells the story of the falling into division and when they are all gathered together this one man they call jesus and they in him and he and them live in perfect harmony in eden the land of life well you are the lord jesus christ whose resurrection they are going to celebrate this coming sunday you tell that to the priests and they will slap you 
or tell that to any minister because they are sound asleep. They do not know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. I tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ is buried in you, and he is your own wonderful human imagination. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he is raised in you, you will raise all in the universe within you. That is the story. So I want to thank my friend for sharing with me her experience and being big enough to remember. If man could only remember his imaginal acts, she remembered when the roof needed repairs or a new one and the cost was excessively high for them at the moment. She remembered her husband complaining about the pain the new shoes caused, the weight of the tape recorder, and then working on the machine, the sewing machine, and it was adequate. It was good, but she would like a new one. And then came out of the nowhere a robbery and took all these movable objects. And then came the insurance that sent the check for 2000 odd dollars that replaced all the movable objects and paid for the new roof with much, much over. So she can actually say, forgive them, father, those who took it. Did they not do her a favor? And yet they are thieves in their own eyes and thieves in the eyes of society. And they are. Do you know who played the part? God. And do you know who actually made them do what they did? The lady who wrote me the letter. Now she knows the words in that 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. So no matter what happens, if we only had the memory, we could trace it to a forgotten imaginal act on our part. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence, followed by question and answers. We don't have question and answers this time around, but I will discuss this beautiful lecture after two minutes of silence. Now, let us go into the silence. found this to be quite interesting as a lecture and we are given the hypothesis at the beginning that we are going to have proof that the law works we get a couple of stories in this particular lecture but they have a unique angle to them the idea is that something kind of bad happens along the way for the imaginal act to come about he emphasizes this in two different stories this is a unique lecture compared to the other lectures we've given because neville sort of goes beyond the usual Blake references and kind of goes deep. We get some new Blake quotes that are pretty powerful that I don't think he's mentioned before. He probably has, but not in any of the lectures I've read so far. 
He tells a story we've heard before in another lecture about his divorce from his first wife and how they couldn't divorce back in the day and he imagined being with his wife. A lot of people that are trying to find a specific person for some reason are very, very much into Neville Goddard. In many Neville Goddard groups, you see people that are sort of obsessed with finding a specific person. That's fine. We all have desires in this world. But a lot of people point to the second time that Neville got married as proof that you can find your specific person. Really, he gives an example. The first person that he married, he knew that person was going to marry her. Inevitably, it ends up being a mistake. And he's stuck in this sort of horrible situation where he's with somebody that he loves that he can't marry. We see that he imagined being married to this other woman and it ends up causing some negative repercussions for his first wife. But it is an example of how he was able to meet and find and love and marry his specific person, in this particular example, his second wife. We have these two stories and he's also mentioned other stories. For instance, in another lecture, he mentions a woman that hears that these two kids that are really, really causing a lot of trouble in the neighborhood are gone and quiet and something happens and the parents die and the kids have to leave the neighborhood. So it's interesting because the Goddard lectures are chock full of these interesting examples that imagination can be dangerous. He does tell you if something happens, it's okay. He always tries to tell you that it's God that did it and I don't know if it's enough. If you go about imagining something that you want and somebody dies for it or something terrible happens to someone else, if we take what Neville Goddard says to heart, then it's our fault. And in this case, the woman had the robbery that caused this. In my own case, I imagine myself moving beyond the limitations that I had for my previous job and inevitably, some people came into my house and shot at me. I survived, but I would never have wanted to manifest that particular experience, but it became a catalyst for other activities and behaviors and things that I did later on. So a lot of times you have bad stuff happening. It may be a harvest of something that you're trying to imagine. So you can start modifying your imaginal acts to make it so that they're less intrusive upon your reality. So I try to affirm that it's within the free will of all it's the best interest of all i try to affirm that my manifestations are a result of all good sometimes i try to stay within that vibration and try to remind myself that i'm imagining and that there's no negative repercussions to my imaginings but it is an interesting scenario and quandary we are often told not to worry about the how but why not i don't want people to die if, for instance, I imagined being a billionaire and it would require a nuclear bomb going off in some town, which led to new work for me, leading me to be a billionaire, I, of course, would not want to be a billionaire, right? So we need to imagine lovingly and we want to imagine the world in a loving way. We want to imagine on a regular basis in loving fashion, not simply the end in all cases, as Neville tells us to do. You could take this example and say, yes, the law works. Imagination creates the reality. That's the law that he's talking about. But we've always known that. And a lot of terrible things happen to some terrible people. The law of assumption or the law of attraction can be a major bitch. It can be very, very harsh. Terrible things can happen to you. This is where for a lot of people, they come to a true understanding of the law. It's all fun and games when I talk about how wonderful the law is and it can bring you wealth, health, and happiness and success. But a lot of people come to an understanding of the law when they look back on the terrible things that have happened in their life. We are all one and we must consider that if people get hurt along the way. God is playing all the parts, but at the same time, as we become good at imagining, we can become better at imagining the right way so that nobody is hurt and that love and good things happen to all. So I try to emphasize good things are happening to all within the free will of all. That's what I always like to say with the free will of all, which I add to a lot of my 
affirmations now because I don't want to violate anybody's free will. They are not acting under any compulsion from me. They're acting under their natural compulsion, which allows for the fruition of my manifestations. But it's an interesting quandary. I'd love to know what you think. Have you imagined something that came true and as a result, something terrible happened? Somebody got arrested. Somebody got killed. Or you had some sort of theft or robbery. I'm sure that we're going to hear some stories. I'll be looking in the comments to hear what you have to say about it. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Be sure to check out the Neville Goddard playlist that has over 200 different lectures. We try to cover and analyze every single one at the end of them. And there's so many more that we're going to cover. I try to find something new and different. Neville Goddard was amazing in the breadth of different things that he talked about through all of his lectures. Even though at some points it sounds repetitive, I promise you it's not. And we are continuing to learn by the examples he gave 50 years ago. And welcome to the Reality Revolution.